you mentioned before that, in your opinion, Jimmy Page's greatest solo is Since I've Been Loving You, right? So why do you feel that in comparison to, let's say, Stairway? To me, it was just so on point. It was so soulful, so bluesy. It but it had a new kind of blues when he jumps. Da, 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 da. Okay, I know that sounds silly for me to do it, but no, cool. jumping from one thing to another quickly, staying right in the blues idiom. But I, I just feel this. I love Stairway too, of course. I love the solo on that. Uh, but it's like, to me, it's it's the climax of the end of that song. Uh, whereas since I've been loving you, solo is the song. Hmm. It's it just it takes what went before and went after it. See, it wasn't on the it wasn't on the tape when they tracked the song. They there was no solo on it. Really, and Jimmy went back hmm. and uh, he told me that about recording it that that day, which was done in England somewhere. And he said, "We said I suddenly just realized, oh, got to have a solo in this. Can't just have a blues riff going on." So he went into to record a solo and didn't have an amp with him just took a guitar and whatever band had been in that particular studio the day before had left their equipment. So there was some other brand amp he had never used, knew nothing about that. Amp. Oh, I don't know this amp, but it's here. I guess I'll use it. Said he plugged into it, didn't even change the settings on it. No way. And did yeah. one, one take. So that's one take that's off the top of his head. One take it's that anyone can do that is, beyond human capability to me that's so cool he said dude. he did try one other take but just said no i can't beat that it's it's like stream of consciousness just yeah. wham do it and it, i just can't believe it every time i hear it that is so cool man specifically remember going down to the bathroom at one point <laughs> while since i've been loving you was playing you know there's something in in recording and production engineering that they call the the hallway effect which which is if you step out of the room and you hear it coming out of the door into the hallway you hear a very different thing than right in front of the speakers at loud volume and working on it analytically so stepping down the hallway i was about to get to the bathroom and i just turned around and said damn listen to this thing this is amazing yeah. that's when since i've been loving you just struck me as said as great as every song is it that's the song that's going to be all time classic lasting forever right there. And just the way, the way uh, Robert was, was wailing on it mm -hmm. near the end and everything. I, I was really completely dumbfounded hearing it back like that after having worked on it quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This might be a dangerous question, but would you think he's a better producer or guitar player? If I had to choose, if you're pointing a gun at me and I was about to be killed if I didn't answer. <laughs> yeah. I might, I might in such an instance say producer and not because he's in any way, not the greatest guitarist, but putting together an entire, not just album, but slew of albums that become iconic, beloved, long lasting part of music history, whatever to do that takes such a brain, such a mental capacity that maybe that makes him a better producer in, in on the Led Zeppelin things. I don't know if he'd do it on, if he went in to produce some other act, let's say. Hmm. That's a different kind of production than being in the band and sort of melding everyone together into one one Spock or something. Yeah, yeah. I would, you know, I can, not to take away in any way from the guitar playing, which is as up there as you can get. And I would give almost anything to be able to play like that, but I'm not going to. So uh, I might I might say producer, but with guitar, such a close second, you can't differentiate. How's that? Hey, that's a perfect answer, actually. And that's really cool because, you know, I think I think when it comes to artists like Jimmy Page, who are so good at what they do, they kind of get locked into the focal point and people forget about, well, they're also really good at producing. Like, for instance, I feel like with Jimi Hendrix, right? He was an unbelievable guitar player, but he also had a great voice. And I feel like because he was so good at guitar, people kind of forget about the voice. You know what I mean? Like a lot of these artists have these multifacets to them, but they're kind of looked over. But I don't know. I guess that's just. The yeah, no, you're, goes, you know? you're exactly right. Absolutely. He's a brilliant guitarist. He's he's uh, some people I've heard some people say, oh, he's sloppy sometimes or whatever. But 
I don't say that at all. I mean, I, and I think most people say he's one of the five greatest ever mm. on the instrument. Uh, certainly maybe top three or top two or top one who, who could say, mm. but uh, to me, he was absolutely brilliant. Uh, he, I, I remember asking him something, how did you do the, the little triplet thing on uh, mm. whatever that was song is yeah, yeah. on, uh, on uh, the second album. And he showed he showed me how I was just, wow, what a brilliant idea. You know, I don't want to give away a secret now, but mm -hmm just a brilliant way to, to make the guitar talk in a different way. So, uh, you know, he was the top, if not very top, top one or two session players in London before he joined the Yardbirds. He played on hits by many, many, many big artists. Uh, the Kinks, The Hoop, Petula Clark, uh, Tom Jones, just, I mean, all kinds of people. He played on their sessions. So he was known as... Uh, the guitarist guitarist in London, uh, super accomplished. Uh, so uh, to me, I mean, I was just soaking that all up. I, he was, I was in awe, still am. <laughs> That's so cool. So, I mean, uh, obviously Jimmy Page is well known for his musical abilities, like on the guitar, but he was also a, a phenomenal producer. Do you think his producing mindset influenced the way he approached guitar playing at all? Oh, I'm sure it did. Uh, I would say he was, one of the most brilliant producers in rock music ever. People just hear Led Zeppelin for what it is, and it is the four best musicians in the world on their instrument at that time happen to all be together in one group. Mm -hmm. That's It's like the Beatles. Uh, they're different in a different way, but when you get four incredible people in one group at one time, that's pretty rare, mm -hmm. very rare. And so they were they were that group, and you hear the band, and you just think, wow, Robert Plant's a great singer. Wow, John Paul Jones is super on bass and keyboards. And then Bonzo on drums. Everybody's just awed. I mean, he's the greatest rock drummer ever. Gene Krupa on, in, in heavy music. So uh, that's you just sort of think of that, but you don't really stop and think. Maybe the general public don't. Who produced this? How did it come together? Yeah. That's Jimmy. He decided what the songs were going to be, uh, brought in some he had written previously with the Yardbirds, brought a couple of those in, and then wrote with either by himself or with with Robert, and more, more often than not, uh, the songs for Zeppelin. So uh, he would choose the songs. He would choose where the recording was going to be, when it was going to be, who was doing what, what it would sound like. I remember him saying to me as we were mixing, he said, I don't mean to sound... Uh, egotistical on this, but I think this album is years ahead of what everybody else is doing or what people will actually ac accept it or understand it mm -hmm. because of the, diff the different rhythmic things we have going. It's really into different rhythms, not just a straightforward beat. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I mean, he was, he was quite aware of what he was doing mm -hmm. and, and how he was doing it. So to me, that's the mark of super great producer. He was extremely musical. One of the things about Zeppelin is I feel like, you know, Bonham, Page, Plant, they get the recognition they deserve. But I feel like John Paul Jones often gets really skipped over. In your view, what was the importance of John Paul Jones in the band, in your opinion? Well, you have to remember, Jimmy had been one of the top session guitarists before, even before the Yardbirds. Uh, John Paul Jones was one of the top keyboardists and arrangers uh, writing charts, bringing in orchestras, doing string parts for people like Donovan and lots of other people. So he was a, already known as a musician's musician, a top guy on the British music scene. So uh, getting him into the band to add that incredible musicality, really many rock bands, if they needed a bass player or a keyboard player, which he was both extraordinaire, they would just, you know, try out a few guys. Oh, this guy plays good. Get him in there. He'll, he'll play the keyboards. That wasn't John Paul Jones. He could do anything musically. So I think he, as you said, uh, of course, Bonham is bombastic and you always hear him banging away. Mm -hmm. So you, you take, wow, great drums. Jimmy's the lead guitarist. So you hear him wailing away. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, 
uh, Robert, of course, is the lead singer. You, yeah. you, you, they're all out front, like you say, but kind of like an umbrella over the whole thing musically, not necessarily the production, but musically of capability was John Paul. I mean, he's just like a, an incredible shield. Uh, like it's hard to describe it. Yeah, no, I he's know what you're saying. emanating yeah. musicality and, and anything that was needed, he could do it in any number of instruments. Um, so to have him, let's say, Kashmir, what would that be without his parts? Mm. You know, good Lord, wouldn't have, you know, and the, the organ on Since I've Been Loving You, it's just brilliant. If anybody could have outplayed Booker T or Keith Emerson at that point, it was John Paul Jones. Mm. I mean, just, but, but he didn't stick to that. He played bass too. And if you may have heard some of his isolated bass tracks, people have these files on out, which I don't like to hear, but hmm. they're out on the internet now. His bass playing is immaculate. It's brilliant. It's like he's like Jamerson almost, uh, in some ways, where the bass drives the song in on several of the songs. The bass drives the song. If you listen to Motown music. Uh, almost any Motown song with Jamerson on it, which is almost all of them, most of them, uh, a good many of them. Anyway, Bob Babbitt too, sorry. But uh, 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 if you listen to a Motown song, uh, a Four Tops song or something, where the bass is driving it and, and just concentrate on the bass, it will amaze you, absolutely amaze you at the melody that bass plays, at the way that it takes takes the song from one section to another. It's just something that a great, great bass player could do. And there aren't that many of them that could do that. But John Paul Jones could do that and did it. It's just, it's a, it's a form of brilliance that's so rare. And that's why I like to say ad nauseum, perhaps, four greatest people in the world at what they did, all in one room, all playing in one band together. Astounding. If you had to, I mean, this might be a hard question, but if you had to pick one song that was very John Paul Jones heavy and say, this is the best one, which would you pick? Oh, the, you know, that's not fair. That's very <laughs> tough. It is what it it's is. It's like, well, you've, you've got four kids. Which one do you love the most? You know, you, oh. <laughs> so, and some, yeah, sometimes you could make that answer, but uh, <laughs> certainly which one you love the least you might, hmm. but uh, uh, I, I, I don't know. Jeez. Yeah, all of his, cool. all of his, where he does the string parts, uh, whether it's Mellotron or whether it's uh, synthesizer or, or just whatever. But how about, <laughs> this might sound crazy mm -hmm. in a way, but how about the electric piano on, on uh, uh, rock and roll? My God. Oh, that's cool. Okay. That's I mean, cool. you, most people wouldn't pick that maybe, but if you just, again, isolate and think of what the piano is doing on rock and roll. It's like little Richard on steroids, but in this brilliant mm -hmm. professorial way, no band has ever rhythmically done what they've done. Hmm. There are all sorts of things where people do dip odd time signatures. We're going to do this in seven, four or whatever. That's not what they're doing. They're in a many times <clears throat> in a standard key signature and doing so many syncopated things off of it that it's just amazing. The things Bonham could do relative to John Paul Jones, just insane. Uh, anyway, I'll yeah. just go on forever. Bonzo actually said to me one time, he said, what do you think of Gene Krupa? I said, oh, I love Gene Krupa. He's, he's my favorite drummer ever. And he said, he's mine too. I'm trying to be Gene Krupa. And if you listen to what he does and look at his setup with the different toms and things, floor toms, that's basically what Krupa invented and came up with. So he would listen to Gene Krupa and really work on the syncopated things and the, not just the solos Krupa did, where he was maybe taking a long solo or battling a Buddy Rich with a solo against solo. I'm talking within the song. Mm -hmm. What Bonham does in every instance, he never loses the plot. He doesn't play the drums in Led Zeppelin. He plays the songs in Led Zeppelin. Mm. And that's a huge difference in drummers. I'd say more drummers than not try to play the drums. And that's fine. Play the drums. Good. But when you learn to play the song with the drums, that's what differentiates a super good drummer. 
And as I say, and never does Bonham let that go. He's always on the song. When you listen just to any syncopated beats he does, mm -hmm. it's within the song. It's the meaning of the song that he does them. It's not just to be fancy or show off or be bombastic or be great. It's to be great within the band. And every one of them is great within the band. And he certainly and it fits that description. There's no other drummer. I think if you did a survey, not necessarily of all music, mm -hmm. let's say, because there were, you know, the Buddy Rich and people like that who were so great at what they did. But if rock music, or especially if you said heavy rock music, who's the greatest drummer? I'd say you'd get over 85% answers of John Bonham, mm. surely. I mean, there's some great drummers in other bands. Absolutely. I'm not putting any of them down. Do you remember when you first met John Bonham or just it, like when you were first getting to know him in general? Like what was what was he like as a person to be around? I went to so many Zeppelin concerts and uh, was always backstage and hanging out with the band and, and whatever. More with Jimmy than anybody, but everybody was there and you interact. He was always very nice. Now, he could be uh, play a little practical jokes here and there mm -hmm. or he could be occasionally drinking maybe or whatever which obviously ended up not being good for him yeah. but uh, uh, very nice guy uh, he was quite young at the time I look back now and I can't believe how young these people were <laughs> uh, I guess and how young I was I just kids really yeah but uh, he was a nice kid how about that <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah that's cool enough man that's cool Robert Plant, you mentioned you did a couple of overdubs with him. Do you remember like how he approached recording vocals, if there was anything unique about the way he handled his craft? He's certainly extremely good at what he does and had a voice that nobody else had at that time or has ever had, really, for that high power thing. Mm -hmm. And his new things, the things he's done in recent years, brilliant voice still. He doesn't do the high super thing because that's harder to do as you get older, I guess. But his voice is just so brilliant, so beautiful. Um, I just remember it as being, okay, a vocal overdub. Here we go. Yep, it's Robert's plant singing. Great. Got it on tape. Next. You know? <laughs> that's crazy, really. What was he like to work with? Was he easy to get along with? Sweet guy, wonderful guy, no problems ever. Nobody in the band was any problem in in, in my eyes ever. Uh, John Bonham could be uh, crazy and wild <laughs> sometimes, you know, uh, having s extra fun. Jimmy would often be quiet backstage or something and, and calm, you know. And uh, John Paul Jones as well, a brilliant, brilliant, man that just had so much musical talent and ability he almost shouldn't have been in a band you know? <laughs> he's like so good it's insane but uh, i never had any problems with anybody uh everybody was extremely nice lovely people that is awesome man that is so cool so you know i mean when it comes to someone like robert plant he's known like as this boisterous leads vocalist but you're saying that like when you were working with him in person he was actually pretty mellow would that be fair to say yeah same with jimmy really uh when you know I'll, i've seen that with several other bands too uh there's a there's a their own persona what they are and then there's a stage persona where they're not just musicians they're actors as well and i don't mean they're being fake it's just you get on stage you're fired up the adrenaline's there you want to everybody has their own way of coming out and being effusive mm -hmm. and if, if you can't do that you're not going to be very good on stage you have to do that uh, so yeah jimmy and uh, robert certainly when backstage in the studio whatever you're just talking like normal people but very very smart normal people and uh then on stage wham the Short opens up, Jimmy's <laughs> firing it out, you know, smashing things around. That's just how it how it goes in rock music, and good. I think that's a great thing because that's that's what people love sometimes almost as much as the music is just the the excitement that that they bring to you. Yeah, for sure. I think part of live music in particular is that experience of like of being witnessing something that's really cool, you know. So, I mean, what was the relationship like yeah. between the two? From from what from your experience, what was the relationship like creatively between Jimmy and Robert? Always great. As far as I saw, they were... Uh, now, I didn't see them writing the songs. That's where they would really interact 
uh, in amazing ways and came up with such great songs, uh, perfect for each other, I'd say, in that regard. But just seeing them, again, backstage or in an office or in the studio or whatever, great friends, got along extremely well. Uh, I'm sure there were some things where people argued at some point in time. I, it's, a band is like a marriage. Uh, there's always going to be ups and downs. There would have to be. I never saw the downs of people interacting with each other. So in my opinion, everything was always perfect, but I'm sure it wasn't. Of course, there would have to be, hmm. hey, don't do that. I didn't like that or whatever. You know, I, I just never saw that. When it comes to Zeppelin's history, the first two records are very much like led by Jimmy in a lot of ways. But by the third record, that's when you start to see, you know, the other guys start to kind of put their influence on it. In particular, Robert Plant, is, it's Robert Plant's often regarded as having kind of like found himself with record number three. In your opinion, is that accurate? And if so, why do you think he kind of found himself at that point? Yeah, I would say that that's partly correct, at least, uh, if not fully correct. I think because all of a sudden he could sing in other ways. Uh, mm -hmm. He could really, I mean, the slow tangerine and things, just so beautiful, so soft and lovely. Uh, who would have thought that would come out of this heavy rock band that everybody was either wild about, or I, I remember a good friend of mine uh, on the first, when the first two albums were out saying, I don't like that band. He always sounds like he's jumping off a cliff and screaming, you know, ah. well, he didn't on this, did he? I mean, he was, uh, he could just sing in any number of ways all of a sudden. And he had written more of the material, uh, co-written with Jimmy, more of the material than on some of the previous material had been more Jimmy, let's say. Uh, so, uh, and it, there's various percentages of all that of course but mm -hmm. just in general so i think he just really kind of felt it as 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 his way to express himself even more so uh all of them really uh, john paul brought in a little synthesizer british synthesizer to put over the thing between the two songs celebration day and friends i think it was just everybody was just adding more of themselves to it they were more cohesive as a band they knew each other better they had been together for a number of years now kind of like a baseball team or a football team you mm -hmm. play two or three years together and all you know what someone else is going to do before they do it kind of mm -hmm. thing yeah so i think that was starting on three and came to its culmination on on four hey i think that's that's a really good assessment actually so in terms of the different relationships between the guys and Zeppelin, obviously they were very close, not just on a creative level, but also on a personal one. If I may ask, did you ever talk to Jimmy Page about John Bonham's death? I think we had a, a conversation at one point after that, and he was just devastated, you know, couldn't believe it and didn't know what he would do, if anything, with the band. And I think I do recall him saying it, that pretty much means the band's over because nobody's replaceable here in this band and i agree but i uh, i don't really it was so long ago now i don't really remember the the exact words of a conversation just the general gist of it yeah no, for sure if bonham didn't die do you think zeppelin would have continued and for how long would if you had to guess that's a tough question it would be totally a guess i would think they would continue because you can always tour and make a lot of money that way and mm -hmm. always put out another album as long as the four of them are there but uh it also is it, it's horrible of course and i would much prefer he had never died but it one thing that came out of it is that it gave jimmy a chance to do some other things that he w probably wouldn't have done otherwise certainly robert did some other things solo records and duet records and things that he's done over the years brilliant things they all did some great things uh, separately uh, but yeah, it's hard to say. I, 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 the best thing would have been if they had continued, of course. So you think that they should have continued without Bonham? Is, is that what your opinion was? I don't know. I don't think oh, okay. they should have continued without Bonham. Uh, to me, you can say, well, nobody's irreplaceable, but in that band, every, I've said it five times probably today, but every person in it was at the peak of what they did in the whole world. And they all did it together. So nobody else was as great at what each individual one did. So in my opinion, 
they shouldn't have continued. Well, they only did the what O two things and yeah, whatever. But yeah, I was actually going to ask you about that. Uh, were you present for the O two concert? No, no, I didn't go. Uh, I've never listened to it or seen it. I don't want to. Hey, yes, fair enough. I, I respect that. I respect that. You know, have you ever met Jason Bonham by any chance? No, I don't think so. Uh, if I if I did, he would have been a tiny baby. So where were you when you heard of John Bonham's passing? I can't remember where I heard it. It's probably on the radio. Uh, but yeah, it was a big shock. I mean, he, he when you consider he died young, I yeah. mean, relatively young. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's always a shock when an artist dies. Uh, you're, I wasn't right. At, they were up in uh, Jimmy's place in Scotland, of course, mm -hmm. uh, on Loch Ness. I wasn't there and, and, and anything near any of them for a while at that point. So uh, you don't see the day to day. You don't know if anybody's going down, downhill, getting ill, doing too much drinking or whatever they might be doing. You don't know that. So of course it's a big shock because it comes out of nowhere. I can't answer for Jimmy or any of the other people who might have, might have seen things sliding downhill a bit. I don't know. It may have been one of those Bon Scott like things. It's just whoop. It just happened, you know. It, you mm -hmm. did one thing too many at one wrong time, and then it's over. So I don't know, but it was yeah, it was a horrible shock. I just couldn't believe it. Yeah, I'm not sure if you had a relationship with him, but were you shocked when Keith Moon also passed away in a similar fashion? I think everybody saw that. I think people saw the Keith Moon thing happening more, much more so though, because he was apparently really a wild man, really over the top with the the drinking and other things. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. I mean, I guess a little bit different topic, but if you had to compare Keith Moon and John Bonham, you know, you, you've said that John Bonham is the greatest. Where would you put Keith Moon in comparison to him? To, to me, and this is only me, one person's opinion, uh, Keith Moon was sometimes, I loved it. I loved the Who's records and things, but he could be kind of all over the place, uh, but in a brilliant way. But Bonham was very studied, very on point, always on point. Keith Moon would shock you sometimes, like, why is that role there? It's crazy, you know? Mm -hmm. And I loved it, but it was, what? Whereas Bonham, yeah, it's supposed to be there. I didn't know Keith Moon, so I can't really say, and I don't mean to put him down in any way. He was fantastic, perfect for The Who, especially in their earlier years. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. The Shell Tell Me things. But to me, Bonham was a much better disciplined drummer. Hmm. So going back to Jimmy Page, your friendship with Jimmy Page goes back to his time in the Yardbirds. Is there anything from that time period that you remember in particular? He loved uh, two of my guitars, dearly loved them. They were both 1952 Telecasters. And one in particular, which I still have them both, he wanted that guitar. He said, mm -hmm. this is, I love the way this plays. I love the way it sounds. I want this guitar. How about, and he had with him, Jeff Beck's Esquire. Oh, that's cool. That, you know, Jeff had just left the band at that point, mm -hmm. walked off and left, and he had left his guitar for Jimmy to play lead because Jimmy had been on bass with the Yardbirds. Yeah. And he switched over to guitar. In fact, side story, I remember be sitting backstage in Murray, Kentucky, and uh, the rest of the Yardbirds were kind of mumbling to each other, can Jimmy handle the lead guitar duties? You know? <laughs> Really? Well, yeah, we <laughs> certainly know he can, but he, to them, was the bass player, a rhythm guitarist, you know. But, of course, he could handle the lead guitar and, and did it brilliantly. But he had Jeff Beck's t Esquire with him, and he said, I'll trade you Jeff's guitar for your Telecaster. I'll deal with Jeff later, but how about that, huh? huh, huh? And I said, oh, really? I love this. My first electric guitar I ever had, I love this guitar. So I decided not to, and I still <laughs> have it. But I've always wondered, I could have had Jeff Best's Esquire. That would be pretty cool. That would be pretty cool. But, I mean, you got the guitar yeah. that he wanted, so that's pretty cool too, you know? Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy. So how exactly did your relationship with the Yardbirds begin? I played in a band in Memphis uh, called Lawson and Four More, and we had just changed our name from Bobby and the Originals, and we were about to release our first single. Mm -hmm. And uh, they got us, um, our manager got us on this, show that was called the dick clark caravan of stars mm -hmm. 
and they were playing at a place called Skateland Fraser in Memphis, in Memphis, or in Fraser actually outside of Memphis. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were on the show. And when I looked down at the at the people on the show, the other acts that we were opening for, you know, we weren't on the caravan, and we certainly weren't the stars. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I looked down and I saw J Gary Lewis and the Playboys. Okay, yeah, and so and so. I think mm -hmm. Bobby Hebb maybe was on it. Okay, the Yardbirds, knowing that I was going to get to at least see the Yardbirds, maybe even meet them. I was really excited. Yeah, for sure. So we played the show and I, of course, got right backstage and was chasing down all the Yardbirds and, <laughs> and uh, got to meet them. So then I found out they were coming back on a, another tour very mm -hmm. shortly. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I decided, okay, I'm going to go to as many shows on that tour as I could, That's which cool. ended up being two shows. And, uh, I would go backstage again, and I really hooked up with Jimmy Page at that point. This would have been 65, probably, something like that, mm -hmm. and uh, just talked to him. I told him uh, that, you know, I was working at Stax Records, which very, he loved that. I mean, he was just, believe it or not, he was wowed by that, really? maybe even more than me being wowed by the Yardbirds. That's hard to believe, but <laughs> uh, so we talked a lot about recording, and uh, he loved the the whole Memphis uh, recording scene sun records uh of course with elvis and jerry lee lewis and johnny cash and roy orbison and and carl perkins all the great great acts that re recorded were big big favorites of the the british guys and and certainly of jimmy mm -hmm. and then he loved also uh anything to do with stacks rufus cool. thomas booker t and yeah. the mgs the things that we were recording at that time so uh, that the last show that they played that I saw was uh, in Murray, Kentucky, at Murray State University, mm -hmm. in the gym, and I uh, talked him and talked Jimmy into riding back to Memphis with me instead of getting on the bus, so we could talk because they were going to Memphis to fly out of there mm -hmm. for the next uh, next there was next shows that was the closest airport city, so. Uh, he said, yeah, yeah, let's ride back and we can talk more about Stax and Sun and Memphis music. Yeah, that's cool. And I said, yeah, I can talk more about Yardbirds and British music and whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so we did and we rode through the night, however long that is, three hours-ish, something like that. Mm -hmm. Got to Memphis at about uh, two or three in the morning and uh, took him right over to Ardent Studios on National Street, which is also where I worked at the time. Hmm. And I, that's where I had all my amps and guitars and all my equipment stored there. And of course I got drug all that out and we sat through about three hours during the night and mm -hmm. early morning playing guitars and, and just checking things out. So he got to see the studio, uh, which was quite good. It was a very state-of-the-art studio mm -hmm. at that time. And he got to see the equipment. We got to be really close talking about things. Got along really well. So then about, oh, two years later, three, no, more years later, four or five years later, mm -hmm. well, I would correspond with him all the time then. He would send me That's cassettes cool. of yeah. the first Led Zeppelin album, the second Led Zeppelin album before they were released. What do you think? You know how. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, we exchanged jackets. Uh, I sent him my, uh, my Air Force uh, pilot's jacket, so le cool. tan leather jacket. Yeah, yeah. And he mailed me his uh, long British Navy coat that he had worn <laughs> on stage so much with all the medals on yeah, it. Yeah, that's awesome. Which, which I started wearing on stage with put my own medals on. <laughs> that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's how pitiful a fan I am. Yeah, that's awesome, but, uh, man. <laughs> so he, but since he knew mm -hmm. where I worked, what the studio was like, that it was, you know, top class stuff, mm -hmm. he called me up and said, uh, look, we're working on our third album. Okay. We've got a tour booked but we're not going to finish it in time. It, they were supposed to support the album with the tour. Mm -hmm. So uh, he said, is there any way you could help me finish this at your studio? And I thought about it. Do I really want to do this? Nah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I said, yeah, sure. Come on. So what they would do is uh, uh, whoever was needed Mm -hmm. Always Jimmy and always Peter Grant, the manager. Yeah. Sometimes Richard Cole, the, the road manager. Mm -hmm. Sometimes any of the other band members if they were needed for an overdub. So we'd, he would decide, you know, what they were going to do. Mm -hmm. Jimmy was completely 100% the producer in charge. He was That's awesome. the yeah. man, absolutely. So uh, they would fly in between shows. They'd finish a show wherever and fly to Memphis 
and uh whoever i would pick it pick them up at the airport drive them through we'd go straight to the studio and start the work mm. i don't remember if they even stayed in hotels probably did That's cool. but uh it was just we only had so much time to work while mm-hmm. there was a day off yeah so uh, we would do that several times until we had the album everything recorded and mixed uh, more mixing than overdubbing. There was some overdubbing, but mm-hmm. it was more mixing than that. And then uh, at the end of that, I took the Jimmy and Peter and I took the album over to a place called Mastercraft on Madison Avenue in Memphis okay. and mastered it to vinyl. Wrote the little inscriptions on the inside That's and all so that cool. sort yeah, of stuff. Yeah. And uh, that was it. And then then once the masters were done, the actual acetate masters for vinyl, uh-huh. I think there were two sets made. I uh, they were boxed up very carefully. The mastering guy there does, you know, they often really carefully box them up and separate them and keep them mm-hmm. pristine because they have to be make records from those. Mm-hmm. And I put them in the trunk of my friend and partner uh, in the studio partner John Fry's car, and drove them to Nashville. Met up with the band there, and I handed the master box over to. Richard Cole, the road manager, he took it to, I think, Indiana or someplace Mm -hmm. immediately and started the records pressing. That is so cool, dude. So when, you know, just on a friendship level, when going back to the beginning of the band, when you saw that Zeppelin first started to take off, what was your reaction? Like, I'm assuming you were happy for the band. Like, how did you react when you saw them just kind of taking off? Oh, I loved it. I remember taking uh, a cassette Jimmy had sent me of the first album to my friend John Scott, who was the, the big DJ on WMC FM in Memphis, and just playing it for him. And he was, holy hell, this is <laughs> going to be something. I mean, all you had to do was put on the very first, let the needle drop on that record or start the cassette and hear the beginning of Good Times, Bad Times. Mm. And it was just, what is this? It was a, It was an anthem. It just... It spoke volumes immediately to everybody that loved rock and roll music. Wow, this is different. This is exciting. This is powerful. And then song after song, the good Lord, you know, it was it was amazing. So I was I was over the moon that my friend had come up with this. It was just stunning. That is so cool. So, you know, seeing him over the course of Zeppelin was what, from 68 to 1980? So, yeah, for about 12 years. How did he, in your view, grow and develop as an artist over the course of the time with Zeppelin? This will sound a bit crazy, but to be honest, in my mind, he was already at the very top from day one. Hmm. Sure, everybody grows and changes a little bit, but what I mean is, in general, the musical power that was in his brain was there from the very instant. It was there in, in the Yardbirds. He just hadn't been able to form it together yet mm-hmm. but uh, and had the right, rightest people all in one room. But uh, I think all that really happened over the time was that more and more of other people's things came out at the same time as more and more of Jimmy's amazing mental prowess infected everybody else hmm. it was like this two things coming together and of course john paul jones was brilliant from the beginning too everyone was brilliant on day one but jimmy was already there so i just saw a mixture and a melding and a group grouping of things in the band these things are hard to, to define yeah but i think I'm, that i think that I'm makes struggling. sense <laughs> i just thought of a random question you know i mean when it comes to zeppelin a lot of people consider Peter Grant like the fifth member of the band, so to speak, right? What was Peter Grant like? Like he was, was he a very aggressive person from what I understand? Like how was he to be around? You know, uh, around me and the band and whatever, he was a total sweetheart. Hmm. He was like a great big teddy bear. He had been an ex-professional wrestler. Yeah. Big guy, very strong, very... uh he could intimidate you if he wanted to, of course. Mm-hmm. But no, just working day to day, he was a lovely man. I really, really liked him. He was so devoted to the band. I mean, he really saw them, not as his kids, because they were too old for that, but <laughs> uh, really as, as a family. And he took care of them like I've never seen a manager take care of, of a band. He really, really mm. loved them deeply. And of course, 
they were being so successful. Mm -hmm. You love that too. I'm yeah, sure. for sure. <laughs> uh, but I have seen him in, uh, I went to many concerts over the years, probably close to 50 or maybe even more than 50 Zeppelin shows live. Hmm. And uh, it, when he needed to be like he, on one show, he saw mm -hmm. a, uh, what he thought were microphones out in the aisles of one of the shows. Mm -hmm. I think this may have been Baltimore. There, uh, there were a, a tripod set up and something that looked like microphones out there. And he was furious. Somebody was recording Zeppelin from the show. So he charged out into there, grabbed the equipment, picked it up, threw it against the wall, smashed it all up. It turned out it was some scientist doing tests of levels <laughs> during sound check to see how loud a band was or something. Yeah. <laughs> but he could literally pick people up and throw them around. And I've seen him do things like that because he was taking care of the band. But uh, so, yeah, he was two sides of him, very tough and aggressive when he had to be, but just a total sweetheart when, when you were there in private. Do you remember first meeting him? First meeting him. Wow. Oh, gosh. I don't remember if it was at a show, if there was a show first, because he was not at the Yardbird shows that I'm talking about mm -hmm. before, even though he did manage them at one point, I believe. But he wasn't at those shows. But uh, so it, it either would have been at the first pickup at the airport when they came for the very first uh, between shows recording and, and mixing thing. Or I might have gone to a show before that and met him. I honestly don't remember, though. But I'm not a – I'm like – he was much taller than that. <laughs> I'm like 100, 140 pounds. He's like 280 pounds or something. Big man. So uh, he, if he wanted to just use that girth and bulk and, and, and intimidate somebody, he could certainly do it. But lovely man to me from the very first hearty handshake and a big hug and off we went that's so cool do you have any one memory of him that sticks out to you well the one i just mentioned of, of smashing up the uh <laughs> the equipment yeah. from the scientists another time backstage uh some people had sneaked in backstage and uh, i think this might have been in dallas or fort worth but uh he caught them with some cameras skulking around and because he didn't allow any cameras, any recordings, anything of the band that wasn't controlled by the band. And I saw him actually pick people up and throw them out the back door. Hmm. Uh, so those kind of things stick in your head. But uh, oh, I don't, I don't want to make it sound like he was a big, tough ogre. He was only doing the things he needed to do as a manager. Mm -hmm. And he had the, the power to do it. Was he a funny guy? Oh, he could be very funny, very, very smart man, mm -hmm. very funny, uh, very uh, astute at business things. He he did all the contracts. He took care of everything to, with, between the band and the label and really, really watched over things like a mother hen. Mm. That's so cool. So when Jimmy Page approached you to do the mixing and mastering for Zeppelin Three, did you have to go through Peter Grant to get it officially contracted or something? Uh, there was no contract or anything. It was all just, let's go to work and do it. There certainly wasn't a contract. It was all just part of the family, part of your friend, helping your friends out, you know? That's so cool, man. So what's the craziest thing you've experienced with Led Zeppelin? I do remember an after show experience that was amazing. They played in Memphis, where I happened to live at the time and work. I was there backstage before the show, but there was a lot of press stuff going on and pictures and things being done. And then they played the show. During the show itself, the crowd went absolutely berserk. They were they weren't sitting and watching. They weren't just standing and watching. The almost entire crowd had stood up on the seats, and they were just pounding their feet, <laughs> standing on the chairs. They're just and this was during a whole lot of love near the end of the show. And it was just insanity. Well, the manager of the Coliseum where they were playing, the Mid-South Coliseum, a man named, believe it or not, Bubba Bland <laughs> was the manager. And he was furious. You were tearing up my place, you stupid hippie kids in the audience. So he literally, and I hate that word literally. I hear it all the time when people don't mean literally. But in this case, <laughs> in actuality, <laughs> The manager pulled a gun on Peter Grant 
and pointed it at him and said, I want you to stop this show or there's going to be real trouble. And it was just, what? That's so crazy. Peter way got Robert's attention. So you've got to calm down, calm everything down. This is getting out of hand. There's actually a gun back here <laughs> and it's not good. Now, just three days before their limousine had been shot between Dallas and Fort Worth and a bullet had gone through the limousine. So Robert, everybody calm down, bring, bring the music down soft, bring it down low, whatever. And they really, you know, da, 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 <laughs> whispering, whispering a whole lot of love. And uh, everybody calmed down. They turned the lights on in, in the Coliseum. He said, I want everyone to sit down. We've got to finish this show. We're having trouble back here with the people of, of the, the facility. So let's please calm it down. Wow. And everybody sat down and all. And then they came back full and everybody's right back up <laughs> screaming. And it was just so exciting unbelievably good yeah, yeah and uh so at the end of the thing i was backstage in the dressing room with only peter grant the four band members and me in this dressing room backstage and i just said guys i've got to apologize for the city of memphis for the state of tennessee for the coliseum this wasn't what most people would do this one man was just over the top, uh, please accept my apology for, for everything. They said, we're never playing here again. We're just furious. So I just couldn't believe it. So that was sort of a special backstage experience. And after that, Jimmy, the rest of the band left. And Jimmy, I had had this gigantic <laughs> Mercedes 300 limousine I had bought that somebody had. And I just couldn't help but buy it. So it was, look... It, it was a think, think it had been a United Nations car at one time. It had a back seat that was as big as a, you could live in it. You know, it was huge. So uh, I had, Jimmy had let me get, get a pass to pull that inside mm -hmm. the Coliseum at the backstage area. Yeah. So we went out and I got in the car. Jimmy got in the car and his girlfriend, Charlotte, got in the car and my wife at the time. And we drove, I drove him to my apartment where I had a, an Indian dinner all set up. We had a, a late night dinner, uh, Indian. He, I knew he loved Indian food and you couldn't get it out and tour in the U S. So I'd had an Indian people I knew make a beautiful dinner, you know, everything. Uh, so, but fans saw the car leaving and they just, <laughs> that, that's Jimmy Page in there. And they were following us down streets and I was driving as fast as I could oh, man. swerving around. It's like a movie chase trying to get away and finally we got to my apartment and we ran inside and locked the door and what a night anyway that is amazing so i, I gotta ask you though i gotta ask you though the guy with the gun what ended up happening with him when the crowd re-erupted uh he was unhappy he ba basically i mean i don't know at that point i was running for backstage <laughs> I, I didn't see the further things that happened i didn't want anywhere near any of that um uh, but a shot was not fired. I know that. That's good. <laughs> and the show ended, and it was very, very bad scene, though. Jeez. You know, it's funny because I would imagine that Peter Grant would typically be the one kind of pushing somebody around, so to speak, instead of getting pushed yeah, around. Yeah. Not with a gun <laughs> in someone's hand. Oh, man. He, he was too smart for that. That's hilarious. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, do you have any, like, just on that topic, is there any one Peter Grant moment you saw where you were like, whoa like this guy is just really going crazy here uh there was one i don't know if i could tell it okay <laughs> uh it's 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 up to you man ooh, it's a bit rude uh in some ways <laughs> okay it, it's up to you whatever whatever you're comfortable I, with. I i i saw him in a restaurant in the uh, restaurant at the uh um Hyatt House on Sunset, okay. what people called the Riot House. Yeah. In the little coffee shop in the morning, every oh, the band was all still asleep, but I was up and and Peter was up. He said, "Come on down for coffee, whatever tea." So we're sitting there, and a particular promoter was there, mm -hmm. and Peter was arguing with him. He had cheated them on the figures. The promoter will do a show, and then and bring you the figures and give your money. And he said, you charge for this and you shouldn't, blah, 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 blah. And uh, the guy was arguing back. The waitress brought up cups of hot tea. 
Okay. Just boiling hot, literally, almost boiling, literally. I said it again, <laughs> <laughs> almost boiling water. Yeah. And uh, Peter stood up, looked at the guy, opened a part of his trousers. Oh, geez. And placed a part of his anatomy in the hot cup of tea. Oh, man. <laughs> and looked straight in the eye and just left it there and looked straight in the eye of the promoter. And the promoter said, I give up. <laughs> you're, you're right. Here's your other money. Uh, wow. That's a, it's just, it's hard to say it without saying words I really wouldn't normally be saying in public. That's crazy. But hopefully that gets the gist of it. But, but he did it for the band. He was yeah. wanting to, you think you're tough? Here's tough. You know, and that's, that's pretty tough. Oh, I mean, yeah, I think that would qualify as tough. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, when, when you were there just seeing this, how do you react in a situation like that? I just keep quiet, sit there and drink my tea. <laughs> Did you have a relationship with Peter Grant before working on this record? Just a minor one, uh, but that really, we really got close during that. That's um, cool, man. I loved him. I loved that man. He was a really, really wonderful guy. That's awesome. And to see him in action out on the backstage shows and taking care of business, wow. That's so it, cool. It was good. Yeah. Was he very hands-on? Like, uh, not like physically. I mean, like, was he very, like, around you during the mixing process, or did he kind of give you your space? Definitely giving space. Uh, Jimmy was hands-on on everything. Hmm. He was very much the producer in every capacity on this. He was really, really, I, I just was astounded by his musical brilliance and, and technical brilliance, always, every every song. But Peter would sit back and, I mean, he wouldn't dare to contradict Jimmy in musically or mm. anything. You know, he knew Jimmy was the guy that was the bread and butter for the band and right there, you know, he was the man. So yeah, he just would say, that sounds great guys, keep going. That's <laughs> awesome. Zeppelin was one of the things they're well known for is their experimental approach to a lot of recording and sounds and whatnot. When you were mixing the, um, the record, was there anything experimental that the band wanted you to do or that you yourself did when it came to putting it together? Well, I've mentioned the tape repeats and loops and echoes and things. We, uh, I don't remember if I thought of certain things or Jimmy asked for certain things. It's just it's too little, too fuzzy to remember that now, but uh, he was always looking for the next new thing, the, the special, because you had to really push technology then. There was only so much you could do. Mm -hmm. Today, everybody can do everything. Mm -hmm. They've got as many tracks as they want. They've got tons of software effects and all this stuff. They don't even have to make it up. It's all there in a, in a plug-in somewhere. So, uh, it, and then that's great. I'm proud of that. I use some of those things too. But back then, you really had to find ways to do it. You could run tape around the room uh, and so that you could have a long tape loop if you needed or just all sorts of things. You I, I remember and probably did this in one or two spots on the Zeppelin album because the tape was two-inch, 16-track tape. So you would find where the noise, a certain noise was you wanted to get rid of. Today, you could just cut, you know, command X, and there it goes off of your off your file but then you, you ha i actually would cut a window in the tape take a tiny piece of the tape out where the noise was <laughs> so when the tape went by there was a little hole but you didn't hear it because the noise was gone now so you just had to you had to push technology then and jimmy was really into that and probably still is today just finding the cool new things to do uh, that's that's what a good producer does too, which he certainly was. Back in, in on sixteen track days, it didn't take quite as long as it might today. I would now spend, like I just mixed for somebody, and I was three days per song mixing, hmm. pretty good long days of mixing for somebody. But uh, back then, I would say we might mix two songs a day, so a day being ten hours ish. Mm -hmm. So four to five hours a song, it, you know, it would vary depending on the song. Some would go quicker than others. One of the songs, we had done a lot of repeat effects and echoes and things. And I remember uh, we thought at the time, oh, we, we could go farther. And we did another mix with more of the effects on them. And then we heard it back and said, no, that's way over the top. People wouldn't accept that. No, <laughs> that's just crazy. So we went back to the previous mix. Yeah. And I still have that pre that other mix, the extra mix. 
it's another thing that was on that leftover piece of tape. That's so cool. And I listen to it now, and it you can barely tell the difference in the other one. You know, it, it you could I would if I could play it for you, you would hear it and go, yeah, that's the same mix, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. You cool. know, but the thing is, when you're mixing, your senses are turned up so high, you've got a microscope turned up, and you're just zooming in, and <laughs> every little thing is magnified mm -hmm. as to what it might actually be. That's why the best producers can do the tiny things with a microscope and then take a step back and look at it with, let's say, a macroscope, anyway, <laughs> the opposite of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they can see the big picture as well as the, every tiny detail. But at that point, we were so into the, the, the effects and, and, and the extras that, that seemed super magnified, and it really wasn't. That's amazing. As, as I've mentioned before, I was a huge fan of Led Zeppelin and the Yardbirds and Jimmy, you know, and everybody involved in the whole whole thing. I was just as big a fan as there could be of it. But when you're working on it, you've got to leave fanboy away. You can't mm. do that. You're there to work. You're concentrating on whatever's right in front of you at that moment. And so I, you don't think of the songs or the project as a whole or the album or whatever you would call it call it mm -hmm. as you were listening to it for enjoyment you just don't do that you're you're analytical you're scrutinizing everything you do uh you're you're trying to make the bass better the the bass drum better the, the you know whatever you're working on you're, you're just working on it so i honestly never heard the entire album as in an enjoyment capacity hmm. until we were mastering it and we just kind of let it all play from beginning to end and i, I was quite blown away we yeah. did that That's well cool. they did that i did a little bit but of course they did that mostly but it was it, it did knock me over hearing it back and that's the first time i ever heard the power of each individual song and especially the power of the, the album as a whole mm -hmm. People ask all the time, what was it like to work with Led Zeppelin? Yeah. And I do always say it, and it's absolutely true. It was another day at work or another number of days at work. Because as I was saying earlier, you go in, you've got to drop the fanboy thing, even if you are the big fan. You've got to be a professional. You've got to, for instance, I'm a photographer now, was then, do shows all over, uh, galleries, museums and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I was then too um, since the 60s mid early to mid 60s i've done that as much as music but i didn't take a camera into the session and take a picture of us working mm. or a jimmy in the studio or anything like that yeah duh what is that you know well the thing is i didn't go to be a photographer i didn't go to be a fan i went to be an engineer mm -hmm. and that, that's what i did yeah Hey, well, I mean, the professionalism comes through on the records. And honestly, sometimes when there's less documentation, it actually makes it more interesting because, like, you kind of have, like, there's a mystery. You know what I mean? Yep, yep, so. absolutely. So do you remember working on Since I've Been Loving You? I always remember Since I've Been Loving You because it's so amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the three things I, I get I hear about or get asked about or whatever the most over all the years is the song since I've been loving you. Um, often people say, what about the drum pedal squeaks? And we, yeah, we knew they were there, but it was part of it. It's part of the music, you know, we possibly could, I mean, today in Pro Tools, you could probably get them out pretty mm -hmm. easily, but then we didn't have Pro Tools, <laughs> of mm -hmm. course. So uh, we could have possibly found ways to get the squeaks out or minimize them. But again, Jimmy said, that's rock and roll. That's part of it. Mm -hmm. The pedal squeaked. The song is great. Let's yeah. go with it. So just just loving that song so deep, so bluesy. It had a it reminded me of, of Memphis music in many ways, mm -hmm. of the yeah. of the Memphis soul, R and B soul things, you know, mm -hmm. the very the deep blues from that area. And I do want to tell one story right now while we're while I'm thinking of it. Okay. I always want to give Jimmy Page such a huge thanks and credit for one thing he did when the he sent all of the credits in for that incredible album cover that that, that, mm -hmm. that was done for it, the spinning disc and all of that thing. He sent all the credits in and they printed it all. They left my credit off of the 
printed jacket for the albums and they had printed literally hundreds of thousands of them ready to, to ship and jimmy got one and saw it and said you've left off terry's credit i'm not having it and he called up atlantic records himself with peter grant and said destroy all those covers i want it reprinted and i want terry manning arden studios memphis tennessee whatever added on it as the credit and it was it came out as the credit then and i just can't believe he did that you know that's such a massive statement and i'll always because that got me other work of course you know the, it's an ad advertisement in a way so uh I, I just always like to say that and make sure if jimmy's listening that he knows thank you <laughs> that is amazing do you still maintain a relationship with him today i haven't talked to him for quite a while now on a few years but uh yeah i mean i need to he may stay it, I don't know, but I stay it several times a year. Oh, I should get in touch with Jimmy. That's so cool. <laughs> but you know, you're you're doing so many things. I, I get so busy constantly doing so. I've got several careers. Certainly, music and photography is as big a one. So uh, there's never time to touch base. Was there any one song you enjoyed working on the most when you were mixing, mastering, or doing the overdubs? I love all the songs in that album so much. I'd say the two that always well there are three i guess that really <laughs> stand out to me uh immigrant song of course mm -hmm. because of it was hearkening back to the previous zeppelin uh power and and heavy rock mm -hmm. sound uh so i just love that and i love the little sounds at the beginning i was about to cut them off really just start it with the <laughs> well, I, that's what you do. You know, there's always sounds before the music starts. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, do we want to cut these here? And Jimmy, no, 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 no. I want those sounds. So we put a, uh, a, a repeat echo thing on it, a tape, echo tape loop on the thing. So it would go, instead of, it would go. That's so cool. Repeat. Yeah. So uh, just things like that, uh, because Jimmy, I had already been mentored by some amazing people. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Bobby Fuller, Steve Cropper, John Fry, Booker T. I mean, so many people that had, Willie Mitchell, that had taught me things, whether they knew they were teaching me or and sometimes or not, I was just sponging it up. But uh, from Jimmy, too, I, he, he taught me a lot of cool, esoteric things, mm -hmm. you know, like that. I wouldn't have thought, let's make, let's keep that funny noise at the beginning and double it, triple it, repeat it. You know, so I was, oh, cool. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, so anyway, that song, Immigrant Song, was wonderful. It was just so strong, so uh, so Zeppelin, because I think yeah. we mixed, we got into that one first for mixing, and I was just, oh, wow, this is Zeppelin. And then when the acoustic things came, of course, it's, wow, this is different. But I remember Jimmy uh, shimmying. Uh, I'll call it his shoulders would go back okay, and forth yeah, yeah. dancing in a sort of a dance kind of thing. Uh -huh. And he, when the, when the thing would just get right, the mix would be just right. Or it was really rocking and he was shimmying. You knew you had it, you know, okay, this is going to be it. We've got the mix now. Uh, of course it was 16 track. It's not like today where you have may have a hundred tracks mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, 80 or 60 or whatever. 16 is all we had. And then thank goodness. Cause it was perfect. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but yeah, I just was awed by the, by the power of that one. That is so cool. Did you guys have to do any overdubs for that song? I don't remember. Uh, it, the overdubs, there weren't a lot. There was a little bit of overdubbing. I think we did one drum or percussion thing uh, with John. And then uh, Jimmy did a couple of acoustic things maybe one electric thing. Robert came and did one part of a song on vocal. I don't remember if John Paul Jones was there or not. I don't think so. Pretty sure he wasn't. But uh, the overdubbing went fairly quickly once the people were there to do it. Quick stuff just to fix a little bit or make something a little better than it was. And then, um, so I'd say 90 plus percent of everything was the mixing. So I don't remember on which songs we overdubbed. Hmm. It's just, it flew so fast. And to be honest, it's it's a while ago. It's what, 50? It's a long time ago, yeah. August of 70 is when you were doing the mixing and mastering. Is this correct? Correct. What happened was, as I said earlier, we did it on off days. 
uh, of tour shows because they were out on tour. So it, normally when you go in the studio to start mixing or to overdub and mix or do whatever, you'd start and you keep going and you finish depending on schedules and whatever. In this case, it would be a day at a time, many days. <laughs> so we'd have to get back in the headspace we were in, back at what we were doing. What did we do last? Oh, yeah, okay. So it was quite different mode of working than, than I normally do, or most people do. So uh, just a day here, here's a day here, we'll do this, okay, back. So <laughs> it was a little weird, but I was happy to do it, and I had blocked the studio out for that month of August. Nobody else came in. Even John Fry, the owner of the studio, just went off somewhere to, to take it, just do it, do what you do. So we were the only people in there, except for the, the cleaner, the maid that came, who was named was Janie, Janie the maid. Hmm. All respect to her. But uh, it was just a different type of thing. But we did what we had to do to, to get it done. It had to get done. They had to get that record out as close to during the tour as possible. <laughs> If that's what you do, you finish an album, then you go tour. Yeah, for sure. You would know the days the band is on tour and what their off days are. But did you necessarily know if during the off days they were going to see you or would they give you like a heads up a day before or something? Oh, yeah. They would let me know because I'd have to go to the airport and be ready to pick them up. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't even use taxis or whatever. I just picked them up, bring them to the studio. And then it, I don't remember if they stayed in hotels sometimes or not, but... A lot of times we'd work all night long and get the morning flight back to the next tour stop, you know, or they would. I, I got to go sleep. <laughs> I hear you. Because it was like a hectic kind of on the fly thing. Were you guys like kind of on edge at all during the making of the of like during the mixing process or anything? Not really. The only thing that would get you on edge is the excitement of the music. Oh, that's um, cool. Just to pump you up to do your best work, you know. Uh, and as much as I've said I was just a worker. I was still loving the songs and really into it and excited by them, of course. You said you were backstage a lot with the band, like after the shows. Were you there with them before, kind of seeing how they warmed up or get ready? Were you ever there at the beginning? Oh, yeah. Yeah, quite a bit. And like, what um, was their process like to warm up for the shows? Well, everybody sort of just gets themselves mentally ready. Robert might be singing a little bit lowly, doing some, you know, exercise -y type things. Uh, Bonham would be beating always on a table, you know, <laughs> or something. Just, yeah. uh, uh, I don't think John Paul Jones needed to warm up. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. And uh, Jimmy was, but more than ever, anything musically, they are always together, always ready. Mm -hmm. I think they just mentally, you don't talk to people backstage too much before the shows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, if you are lucky enough to be there, usually you're not there mm -hmm. backstage and in other most bands. With Zeppelin, I, with such a close friend of Jimmy at the time, I was just sort of there. But uh, before the shows, you don't say too much or get them off off topic. They got to be thinking, shows coming up, just get get ready. And I know whenever I've done shows and things, I'm like that too. You just close your eyes, mentally prepare, think of what's going on, what you're going to do, try to remember the lyrics, that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the things about Zeppelin that really sticks out to me is the fact that, like you're saying, all four guys in the band really kind of collaborated. What was the relationship creatively between the four of them? And that always reminds me of a story Jimmy told me, and I think he's told it publicly several times, but just the day they all got together, and they started, let's just go jam, let's practice and see if this works. He said, like, halfway through, the very first thing they all played, they all just, without ch stopping playing, just still going, but all of them looked at each other at once and just started laughing, just saying, damn, check this out. And this, this is it. We're not changing a thing. So I think it just it just grew and grew and grew. Uh, the, the, the other two guys, meaning... Bonzo and Robert just grew more confident as things went along. John Paul and Jimmy grew more uh, infectious of, to the rest of them as things went along. Hmm. So I wanted to ask you about the song Out on the Tiles. What was it like working on that song? I remember on that song specifically, mm -hmm. the drum track was recorded in mono, all the drums on one track. And because, you know, you had to, if you needed lots of tracks, you couldn't just spread things out like people do today. One single drum part 
on every diff separate track. So uh, for stereo to get the, the effect of the toms being over here and coming across panning and things, I would actually take the pan pot of the drums. So he'd be playing the beat. I think the bass drum was on a separate track, but the snare and toms were together. And um, he would be playing a beat, the standard beat, and then when you come to a roll, which there are a lot of rolls in that song at the end, especially, I would grab the pan pot and whack it to the left real fast so the tr the, the roll could start on the left, bring it across the, the sound stage uh, into the center, over to the right, and then qu quickly get back for the next snare hit. And on at least one place, to this day, I can listen to that and hear where I missed it, and the snare is still over on the left, and then it quickly mm. pops back to the right but I actually missed the pan there. Hard to do all those things. No automation, no uh, special, you know, computer aids for anything. It's all manual, everything at that point. Yes, that's, that's part of the charm though. Like and it comes out really well. Uh, on, it, maybe, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've read a lot of people mentioning that Zeppelin three, even more so than Zeppelin four, kind of really changed the course of rock music in a way because Zeppelin had so much attention on them, and then they changed their sound with this record. So it had this massive influence on a lot of people. What is, like, sonically, musically, what is it about Zeppelin III that was so much different than the previous two records, in your opinion? Well, obviously you had much more acoustic things than had ever been done by Zeppelin before. Although they had, uh, did he call it White Summer, or the... the whatever he had done. He did a few acoustic, little acoustic things before, but it was more just the heavy rock, mm. which made them. And I think it was just the fact that it, there was so much more musicality. It spread out so much. We're not just, and not to pick on any other heavy rock band, then that's all they did, let's say, but we're not just a heavy rock band. Look at this. He can sing soft. We can play acoustic. We can do string-like things. Just showing so much more depth and and the word musicality again of things they could do, uh, without which, who knows where they would have ended up. But that it was a big turning point in their overall ethos, and I think a very important one. I've read where Jimmy and Robert have both said that in recent years, like without three, and that was our major turning point thing so i was just thrilled to be a part of it in whatever way i could and uh can't i still look back and can't believe it you know yeah. it's just amazing from what i understand when when zeppelin 3 came out the critical response wasn't very good would that be fair to say uh yeah you had some of course it soared to number one in the world mm -hmm. so that's that's a good response but i remember a uh a review in rolling stone which came out and it was saying that they had lost their power. They'd gone acoustic and blah, they changed, whatever. This isn't near as good as the second album. And I was mentioning it to Jimmy at one point and he said, go back and look at Rolling Stone's review of the second album. And then he found it and read it. And it said something like, not near as good as the first album. Mm. So it's just kind of a thing reviewers do sometimes yeah. because they were cutting edge. They were writing the script of, of heavy rock music at that time. They were making it up as they went along, mostly Jimmy, well, all of them, but certainly Jimmy at the at the leading the pack. Uh, so uh, it, it's hard for people, especially reviewers who, who have to put their two cents in. And I'm not against reviewers. I've had lots of good reviews and bad reviews too. That's no, that's no problem. But uh, sometimes it's just hard to understand where someone's going Mm -hmm. where they're leading yeah. with it because that without the third album zeppelin i i can I feel pretty sure in saying this they wouldn't have become the all-time huge band that they are they would have been big i mean you like a deep purple or ozzy osbourne or or you know whatever yeah mm -hmm. uh, but i don't think they would have had iconic godlike status quite because they changed what they were doing hmm. they changed jimmy knew well that if he just kept pounding away when they were great every i love the first two albums i love every song on it everyone loves that but without the the change in direction turning down a road and going off the main road a little bit i don't think it, it well they had to do it they had to do it and it made them it it 
let them become a multifaceted band, not just a hard rock band. Lots of acoustic numbers, lots of uh, soft things, and then bashing into the loud, hard thing they do so well. For sure. So, of course, another huge band that experimented with their sound over the course of their career was the Beatles. Did you have any relationship with the Beatles? I met them all at one point, but no real relationship. You know, the one thing I've always regretted so much, <clears throat> I think it was when they were making Revolver or maybe the, the Rubber Soul. Maybe it was Rubber Soul. Uh, I was working at Stax in Memphis, mm -hmm. and uh, they called uh, Brian Epstein called up Stax and said that he wanted to come and record at least a song at Stax with the Beatles. Could they do that? And uh, they said, yeah, sure, we can do that. And what, he's, what Epstein told them is it's got to be totally undercover, totally quiet, no press, don't let anybody know. We want to get in, do it, then later we'll talk about it. If we don't do that, we're not, we can't do it. Because they had too many, you know, screaming girl problems and stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, Al Bell at Stax came to me and said, hey, the Beatles are going to come to a song. Would you engineer it for us? And I said, nah, I don't want to. Okay, yeah. But no, <laughs> of course, I immediately said, absolutely. I definitely would be involved. I was so excited, so fired up. I was going to get to record a Beatles song. So what happened was that one person at Stax who was one of the co-founders, a lady, leaked it to the Memphis Press Cemetery newspaper. Oh, man. And an article got in the newspaper that the Beatles might come to Stax to record. She just couldn't help it. You know, it was so exciting. Number, biggest thing in the world, the Beatles at that yeah. point. Ed yeah. Sullivan, all that stuff. So uh, Brian Epstein called back up and said, I'm sorry, we have to cancel it. We can't do it. And that song was going to be Got to Get You Into My Life. Huh. And if you listen to it, you'll hear George Martin's attempt at the Memphis horn arrangement and sound. Mm. But it's not what the Memphis horns would have done mm -hmm. or arranged or would have been played at Stax. But uh, so that was my relationship with the Beatles that didn't happen at the last minute. And I was so sad. Still am. Oh, man. I cry every day. <laughs> so going back to Zeppelin, do you remember working on their song Gallows Pole? It was much longer than the, what ends up on the record. So we would, we did, I did a massive amount of editing on that, cutting out uh, four bars here, eight bars there, whatever, to just keep the best, because it was too long to fit on the record, really. So Jimmy wanted it shortened. And I put those bits I cut out on just a separate reel and just laid it up on the top of the machine. Yeah. yeah. And uh, later I found it because Jimmy takes all tapes, of course, back with him. Mm -hmm. But we forgot about that one. And it was, I've still got it. So uh, occasionally, and I haven't for a while, but occasionally I'll play the outtake, the, the so cutout. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some of them are forwards. And just because I was throwing it on a reel, some of them are backwards. So it'll go, you know, dan, 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 so overall, how many days did it take for you to mix Zeppelin three? I'm pretty sure that we did about six times of coming six days or maybe seven, counting the mastering of coming in and working at least six, six times. We sometimes would do two days in a row if there were two days off of working. But um, I just can't remember exactly. And I didn't write it down. I was just just doing. I just look for the proper balance because the only tool an engineer has is volume hmm. and you can say echo well that's just the volume repeating itself in some way you can say uh chorus well that's you know any number of things you can say it all comes back to the volume so certainly at least you could say the number one tool of an engineer is volume so i just try to get all the vo volumes in balance first and then feature as needed for various things. So mm -hmm. I would have used that same technique on that. Again, nothing out of the ordinary of what I would, I would do or what Jimmy would do or want. 